Blog Talk Radio. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. I know the All-Star Game is taking center stage in Coors Field, but we are the pregame festivities to that. This is the American Sports History Podcast, live from Cleveland, Ohio, hosted by my good friend uh, Peter Ray. Yours truly, Mark Mancini, producing this, 347-205-9631. Catch the archive version, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini Sports. Powered by uh, Mancini Media. So, without further ado, it's more him, less of me. Let me lay the red carpet, put the podium in its place, hand off the mic. First of all, Peter, how are you today? Second of all, how can you be reached? Third of all, it looks like you called the bullpen and in came another guest. A, a legend replacing a legend tonight. Hi, uh, Mark. I'm doing very well. I have a YouTube channel. It's my name, Peter J. Ray R E A. I'm on Facebook as well. And yeah, tonight we're supposed to we were supposed to have Mike Buchheister, who's at the Man Hour. We do not. He's unavailable. And uh, tonight we have a pinch hitter, Michael Krepensek. They call him Cabby. He has a show on the um, Mark Mancini Sports Podcast Network. I believe it's Left Turn at Alcatraz. Uh, welcome to the show, Michael. K- Cabby Krepensek. Krepensek, uh, I get them all. Uh, you can you change the A's. Uh, there's creepy insect, creepy insects. Uh, I've heard it all uh, in my during my illustrious military career. <laughs> uh, Cabby, what was your uh, baseball MLB baseball team growing up? Oh, absolutely, the Giants and A's. I, I am a Bay Area freak that I do not get into this A's Giants because uh, the, I love the Giants, that I love the A's both. You know, uh, until a few years ago, they never played each other. And then in 89, you know, we had the nice World Series uh, interrupted by a earthquake, a little earthquake, a little thing we call earthquakes out here. Uh, yeah, but I, 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 right now I would say if the Giants played the A's, I'd probably root for the A's because the Giants are coming off of uh, three World Series wins in a row. Uh, but before that, I'd probably root for the Giants. What was your first I, year I following the – I'm not going to shut out a league in baseball. You've got to go AL, NL. You know, and, and we're blessed to have both both leagues in this uh, regional area or whatever. What year was your first year following uh, Major League Baseball? Ooh, that's a that you know I asked Mark Mancini that that's a great question. I would have to say cognizant as a kid and understanding stats and not just hitting the ball around. Probably the New York Mets winning the World Series, you know, in, in the middle of the year. 1969. Yeah, and I, you have, I have no recollection. Uh, that's those, those sirens are not for me. Uh, give me one second here, for these past. boy. I live in a crazy city. That's uh, I give you that. And there they go, off to the races. Uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, '69 Mets. Uh, but I, I, you know, back then it was Willie McCovey, and uh, he was setting the mark for Grand Slams. And uh, you know, my. Uh, Barry Bonds is my second favorite Bond. Uh, I'd probably say my favorite Bobby Bonds. Uh, just an unbelievable talent. And then you got Mays. Uh, you know, he was a little little past his prime, but even even in his 30s and 40s, this guy was the best. Uh, and you know, the Oakland A's winning three World Series in the early 70s. How how, how can you top that? I mean, the way the, the, the game is played, uh, money, monetary-wise, uh, just just all around great baseball. And then, you know, with the Giants, I'd like to go back into the history of uh, Gaylord Perry, obviously a great pitcher for Cleveland. Uh, I was buddies with Ed Whitson, who was another Cleveland pitcher. Uh, he was there in the bullpen with, the, who was that, Ritz, Rick Sutcliffe, I believe he was. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Was, uh, the good old days, you know. And uh, I actually was the cab driver for uh, – um, uh, when I was in San Diego uh, going to college uh, for uh, Bob Lurie, who was the owner of the Giants, but his GM or his uh, brain or whatever you want to call it was Al Rosen, which uh, I'm not key. I had easily the best baseball discussions because uh, – 
when you're in my cab, it's like 20, 30 minutes from the stadium to the hotel. They're basically a captive audience. They have to listen to me. They have <laughs> to talk to me. And, uh, yeah, no, Al Rosen, you know how he, what he did for the Cleveland in the 50s. Uh, just just a premier hitter. And, you know, like we, we have a, in our circuit of uh, ball players like to come do our shows, we had Kevin Mitchell in March. And you know, I can't I can't see no other reason. Kevin Kevin Mitchell, you know, had he had success with the Mets, went to the Padres for half a season, but with the Giants, won the MVP, batted like just crazy, three something, forty some home runs, uh, MVP uh, eighty nine. It was I, Al Rosen. Al, Al, I don't know that guy. Just he knew baseball. Uh, uh, better than anybody. I, I, I'm, I'm talking about top executives, et cetera. I don't know. Yeah, and he uh, – did you know how much when you had him in the cab about his playing career? Oh, yeah, no, no. I, the, the first day I had him in the cab, I went – Yeah, I, I have every uh, year of who-who's in baseball. Yeah, I'll be uh, – I'll, uh, believe me, by the second cab ride, I was telling him stuff that he didn't even remember, you know. And it's just a thing, you know, like it, it, it's a thing of uh, – it's like Barry Bonds. People want to get on his case, and they go, oh, it's steroids. You know, Cleveland is a hard home run hitting park. Uh, so, you know, your average hitters are, are the ones that are going to be, uh, uh, you know, they're special. Uh, I, I really, you know, and I'm not saying it's just because I hate the Dodgers, but, you know, like this little scene before the All-Star there's everybody swinging for the fence. That's just bad baseball because, yeah, you can hit eight home runs in a game or set the record for home runs. But you know what? When it gets to the playoffs and then you're talking about great pitching because it's you're not in the playoffs unless you have great pitching. These guys are not going to be giving up home run balls at the same rate like a regular season does. So, like, you know, you need your Al Rosen, you need your spray hitters, your Tony Gwynn's, your Rod Carew's. Uh, Rosen, that guy, like, what was his batting average half, like 360 or unbelievable, the, the, the contact this guy made. You're either a Ty Cobb or you're a Babe Ruth, and Rosen was definitely a Ty Cobb. You know, I became a, I really became a diehard uh, a Cleveland Indians fan at the end of the 72 season, which meant I watched the World Series and, you know, saw the A's win their first and then, of course, the, the next two. And the Oakland A's, 72-3-4, uh, and four, uh, are really burned in my memory and uh, probably my favorite team. Because you know, I mean, they were they were the best, and and they had just and they had you know, I was a kid, so you know, when you're a kid, guys with mustaches, are, you really think that's pr- really cool, and of course they all did right. something new, and then and then those colorful uniforms, that was something new as well, and then all oh, these guys, Catfish Hunter and uh, uh, the whole team, Sal Bando, Burt Campanaris, uh, they um, uh, Gene Tennis, Joe Rudy. Uh, Ken Holtzman, Vita Blue, and we we had Blue Moon Odom briefly uh, in '75. But anyway, they were just such a. <clears throat> in fact, I was the other night I was watching an All Star game, old All Star game, and Catfish Hunter was pitching, and boy, he he wasn't throwing hard. And I thought, uh, but the guy obviously, yeah, he could. Um, he was effective. He wasn't blowing. The, he wasn't Nolan Ryan, but I thought he was the coolest uh, pitcher. And I thought, you know, Reggie Jackson. And of course, those two both went on to New York. So, anyway, the Oakland A's of the early '70s will always be a team. Uh, those fellows are always will be in my memory, and just being just uh, really entertaining. And you know, Charlie Finley and the the whole that what what a what a story, what a what a drama. <clears throat> The underdog role, that you know, that's the part of – that's why, I, like I said, I'd root for the A's instead of the Giants. It's just the underdog – you know, to be a franchise like the Oakland A's and compete with your Yankees and compete with your Angels, you know, and then these guys have payrolls that are just psychotic, and, you know, the A's will never uh, – they may do it with Chapman. Uh, I'm hearing, like, a little twi- a tittering there. But the, the the thing I love was the first year before that, you know, you go back to the 71 series, 
And it was the Giants playing the Pirates, those evil Pirates of Mark Mancini. Yeah, we said it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Giants lost in four. I remember Mays. The Giants won game one. Uh, I, we actually listened to that game at a Stanford football game versus Duke. And they played game one in 71 over the loudspeakers. And the A's were playing the Baltimore Orioles in 71. And Baltimore kind of kicked their butts. But you know what I mean? It's like the Giants didn't do it. But for the A's, uh, you know, that 71 season set them up for this. uh, uh, You know, they were obviously just fresh from Kansas City. Uh, My dad, this was uh, his business partners back in the day. They owned the uh, uh, San Jose Bees, which was a Kansas City farm club. It was double A. Uh, and that's kind of I, I knew that baseball before the major league baseball, and at the time, like you said, we didn't you know realize what we what we had. There was double A ball, but that's the team that had George Brett, Doug Bird, I, I think it was Freddie Patek, all those guys, and you know, you know, for them to get together in '85 and then win the World Series, and you know, in a, a that weird way they beat St. Louis, that was just fantastic. But like I said, you know. At the time, you're watching George Brett and Double A Ball. You're not realizing you're seeing a future superstar like that. It just was. Uh, we were more into minor league ball than the major league ball. Uh, well, I've got a question. A I got a Go question for you, Cavi. Uh, since you're a Willie Mays fan, uh, in the '73 World Series, near the end, I was. I read a book about the '73 season, and you know, near the end, Yogi Berra was manager and. Willie Mays was definitely struggling in center, but um, there's been talk about, uh, you know, that Barra could have put Mays in as a pinch hitter uh, late in uh, in the last game, and he didn't. Now, have you, have, you, have you heard about that? Have you thought about that, well, whether you wish Mays had gone in? And that was the end of his career. I don't remember. I do remember he does have a. You know they they got rid of the stat from the players. You you remember about twenty years ago they had the game winning RBI, and uh, you know the the winning RBI. Mays does have a pinch hit single, and I do believe it was his. Uh, I believe it was the eleventh inning, and I I may be wrong, but it was game two. Mays did have a pinch hit single that won won the first game for the Mets. I may be wrong. It might have been the second or third game. But remember, that 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 Mets series went seven games. Uh, I, I can barely remember. Uh, was it Jerry Grody was on there? Uh, um, Wayne Gross, those guys. Oh boy, I, boy, these are some really good memories, though. I can't believe it. And I'm not doing this in front of a computer. It's pulling it. But Mays, I, you know what? I was totally... I was bummed he hit it, but I was so such a Mays fan that when he beat the when the Mets beat the A's that day with his pinch hit single, it was you know I I was rooting for the guy. It was uh, I was you know upset that the A's you know it was kind of a, a mixed blessing as they say. Yeah, you know the '70s uh, base uh, MLB. It's again the whole decades burned in my memory. You know the. The Pirates in seventy one and seventy nine and the A's seventy two three four and then the Reds the big red machine seventy five and six and then the Yankees uh, seventy seven seventy eight and that whole I mean to me that whole story of of that decade is just so um you know that's yeah. just so and like the seventy I I thought the seventy five you know seventy five World Series was so uh so you know, uh, so dramatic, and I just read. I was reading a book. They talked about this author was. I mean, I guess Red Sox fans have been forever looking back on that, and and he was talking about Denny Doyle. Denny Doyle was playing second, and according to this author, that he, I guess, that he was too slow and he didn't make a play, and he he referred to him as waddling, and I, that's one of the things that stays in my memory. The seven and the, uh, Louis Tian, you know, and that what what a. I mean, actually, I would have to say the '75 is my favorite World Series. Carlton Fisk, yeah, it's all. You know, it's kind of rough because it's, um, you know what I mean. It, it, like you said, Boston kept trying to climb over the hill, and you know, eventually, like in the 21st century, they finally did it right. But it's got to be heartbreaking if you're a Red Sox fan and that big red machine. You know, 
out of all the teams we mentioned there, and there's just 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 go over the pitch and staff like what you just said. Uh, we were looking at obituaries here. I want to uh, Mudcat Grant. Uh, he passed away. Uh, Rennie Stennett from that team, uh, Pittsburgh team. He just passed away. All these guys are like. Uh, uh, but you know, let's go to that Baltimore. What was it, Mike Quayar and. Uh, Jim Palmer and uh, you know uh, who was the who was the guy Pat Dobson uh, yeah and you think yeah. about you know okay yeah you feel the team right but look at everybody's pitching staff here here's the A's Vida Blue we just talked about Vida with Mark uh, Vida Blue a uh, Catfish Hunter Blue Moon Odom Mud Cat Graham. You know, and, and then your, your reliever is Raleigh Fingers. Okay, good luck getting a job there. And then go to the Baltimore, go to the Pittsburgh ones with Candelaria, Bruce Tyson, uh, all these guys. Uh, uh, just amazing. But it is. It's a, it's a thing of getting three to four great starters all synchronized on the same level. And like you said, the 75 uh, Cincinnati Reds, you know, uh, nobody matches Johnny Bench on defense and offense. Uh, well, let, let's go over the Cincinnati. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screw this up. Uh, we got Concepcion at uh, shortstop, oh, Gold Glover, a uh, Geronimo in center field, uh, Tony Perez, uh, unbelievable hitter, Johnny Bench, obviously, uh, Joe Morgan. Oh my God, Joe Morgan. Oh boy, and then uh, Pete Rose over there. Uh, Wow, any any uh, empty spots? You know, some rookie can come in and get a few at bats. Uh, no, I don't think so. But uh, the, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the Cincinnati. Don Gullett, uh, Nolan, Gary Nolan, Jack Billingham, uh, Jack Billingham. Oh my God, and, and, and just amazing. I mean, these are names. I mean, obviously, we know that, but you know that 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 goes down in history. Because it takes a, a, a team of Cincinnati pitchers that are just all-star lights out, and then you match it up with the Baltimore uh, starting four. That's Mike Cuellar and uh, Palmer, and oh my God, uh, uh, and go back to the Mets, Seaver, Kuzman, um, any any of these guys, and, and you know I think that's missing because you know the Yankees try to replicate that nowadays, uh, you know, and the Giants actually did it with this little run where they hit the three World Series, but that's harder than hell to get three or four starters on the same page. And guess what? You do it, you're going to win the series. It, pretty simple a mathematical formula there. You can figure it out. Well, you know, we all know that uh, we're, we're, there's a, the, the, the years and the decades are connected. If you go back to the 60s, something I didn't, you know, I was, I was very young. I was born in the 60s. So, but the 66 Orioles, you know, come out of nowhere, win it all, and it, Frank Robinson's the new player. And you know, then I then I realized this, this is why Cleveland picked him up nine years later to be the first black manager. They're hoping that he could do for us what he did for that team. And then, of course, they went in six. They actually lost three World Series. Or they lost two out of three World Series, but they won in '66 and '70. And then, but anyway, throughout the '70s, they were down, they were you know a strong contender. There's this great video of uh, Earl Weaver uh, having this argument with an umpire. That it's just so, so funny. And I was talking. We had a one guest on. They said, "What can they do to get uh, make games more interesting?" I thought, "Well, why don't they encourage uh, allow these uh, uh, managers to you know go crazy and f- use a lot of foul language." Foul language and the fans. I mean, the fans love that stuff, and it, I guess they don't do that anymore. But anyway, the the Orioles. Uh, yeah, I think about those guys: Brooks Robinson and Mark Belanger. Boog, and we had Boog Powell and Frank Robinson in '75, and I That's thought it was oh the, the coolest thing in the world. And we had Pat Dobson. We had a bunch of Orioles pitchers. We had Pat Dobson, Wayne Garland, uh, Ross Grimsley, later Dennis Martinez, but. Yeah, the Orioles were. Uh, that's why it's funny seeing them now. They really they're struggling now. You, and of course, that's a long, long time ago. But they were a, a tremendous team also in the seventies. 
No, you know, I like your 60s reference because, like, you, ha- you know, if you love the game, you're going to go back a little bit. And, you know, I- I'm going to go back even to, like, 59, the, si- the Pirates. Uh, they were saying what, the last team to win the World Series with the hit and run, uh, the Mazeroski home run. But it wasn't him. It was, you know, the- the- this book went, like, in-depth on it. And then I got to- I want to go back just a couple years with the Milwaukee Braves and that little-known guy, Henry Aaron, on the Milwaukee Braves winning the World Series and forcing the Yankees to win in Game 7 the next year, which ended up being a split, you know, and the Yankees have always with uh, Mantle and stuff. I'm amazed that wouldn't it have been just great if, if Milwaukee won both those World Series and just stuck it to the Yankees? You know, I, I'm going to go with Cleveland, and I don't, but Boston goes nowhere without uh, Manny Ramirez, and that was the one that always bothered me because Manny, you know, you could lose Albert Bell or you could lose this, but the Manny Ramirez going to Boston, that was a heartbreaker for me because, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, it, it, it's not like he's going to a team that wins the World Series because Boston hadn't won it. But uh, if I had to pick one guy that why Boston won three World Series in the 2000s, it, it, it's got to be Manny Ramirez, the Cleveland Indian kid. You know uh, the, the the yeah if if the Braves won in '58, uh, maybe they don't leave and because uh, I think I think they're up three one in that series and it kind of reminds me of the '96 Braves who, you know, team going for back to back and don't and don't don't win and you know you're and then how do you respond to that? But um, of course we have we have Terry Francona in Cleveland. I, I give Frank, Francona the credit. For the World Series titles, because of his po- you know his positive attitude, he's such a you know it's losing is tough. You have young guys, and you know right now I think Cleveland it doesn't have uh, if they had a hard uh, hard guy manager, a, a real strict tough guy, I think they'd be going diving toward 400 or below. Uh, but with because you know the, these guys you know it's so competitive and. He he really instills confidence in people, and he's he's just a very caring. He knows the game, and so anyway, I'm just I'm just so grateful that we have uh, Terry Francona in Cleveland. But we couldn't pay Manny Ramirez. There's no way. I give the Dolans credit. The uh, Cleveland owners, the fans here, don't seem to not many seem to want to do it because we don't have the money here. We we can't be paying these guys. So Manny had to go and take his. Uh, and have his uh, batting helmet where you couldn't read the B. And uh, <laughs> the, I was happy when the Red Sox won. I was really at least the first time, not the second, because then they they beat us in the ALCS when we were up three one. But uh, that's how these teams are. They win one, then they won. It's like a drug. You want you want to keep winning. And uh, well, it's uh, absolutely only one team's going to win every year, each year. So that's that's the life of a sports fan. You know, uh, and and the Cleveland story. I, I thought, you know, they had the new stadium. Uh, you guys built it. I had a buddy from Cleveland. He was sending me pictures of the demolition of the old one, and the new stadium was like, uh, you know, a lot, a lot more seats. And they were building it on the cusp of uh, uh, the recent World Series uh, uh, visit. But, you know, uh, this player thing, uh, I, I thought COVID might wipe out some of these crazy contracts. Uh, I do not, I, for one, do not believe Mike Trout should have half a billion dollars or Mookie Betts or whatever. Yeah, I know they all believe they deserve it. And it, obviously, if they can get it, you know, uh, the way it's rigged now is – uh, there's these, t- you know, the, uh, there's these teams just wasting, spending money, and out of all these superstars that shouldn't get paid or not paid or whatever, I, I got to go with uh, uh, the one I like is Fernando Tatis on the Padres. He literally has given this the Padre franchise is just like everybody else with the, uh, um, uh, you know, the the, uh, the the markets against them and stuff like that. Uh, but this guy, you know, his contract, I mean, it's still ridiculous, but he, he signed for like 20 mil for 13 or 14 years. And it's not the 30 or 30 plus that these other guys were getting. Uh, and you know what? Uh, tell me that the, Fernando Tease immediately goes in there 
and has this great effect. They got this rivalry kicking back with the Dodgers, goes back to the 1980s, hasn't, hasn't been heard from or seen. And then you got Machado in there, uh, same type of thing. You know, obviously Baltimore couldn't pay him. But uh, I can't stand these contracts, but I think the uh, Padres got Tatis uh, for a bargain. Uh, compared to what these other guys are getting. I mean, and and the best part is uh, I'm not going to pay a half a billion dollars for an outfielder because outfielders are a dime a dozen. But, you know, Tatis, you're talking about a shortstop. You're talking about Jeter or you're talking about uh, – th- that's a big edge. If, if your shortstop does not match up with Tatis in your division or your league or whatever, uh, the edge goes to the Padres. And uh, – uh, for for that kind of money, uh, hey, good for him, you know. And then obviously they're doing great success. And, you know, yeah, let's go to the Giants now. You know, the Giants are supposed to be last place. Uh, same with the Boston Red Sox. Uh, both these teams are the leaders of their uh, respective uh, uh, conferences or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it. It's kind of an amazing job. And you know, this Kapler, uh, we were not big fans of his, but he's taken a, a, a team of refugees. I mean, literally. Pulling these guys out, we had no uh, minor league, no draft picks, uh, and and this guy has worked some sort of miracle. And and you know the the great story is this guy Mike Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski's kid, uh, grandkid. Guy is a minor leaguer until he was 28. Uh, how much do you love the game if you're still plucking away when you're 28? You know, comes in, gets the Giants. He's not on anybody's chart. Uh, This guy hits like Carl Yastrzemski used to hit. And he's got power, and he's got he he hits nice lines. Not these pop fly home runs uh, like Alex Rodriguez hits. Uh, We're talking about drilling the ball and and missiles coming off the bat. Uh, What do you think about the Giants and their uh, last place prediction? And they turn it around and turn it into the best record in uh, the National League. <clears throat> well, it's, it's great, uh, and it's great that the Yankees are down a little, so only a little <laughs> above 500. Uh, I love that idea. Uh, you got more than you know. Yeah, yeah. Derek Cole, 500. Is, is right. this uh, so? This uh, Yastrzemski fellow, what's his first name? Mike. Yeah, yeah. Mike. Is, is he Mike. in the majors okay, now? Yeah. What's that? Is he in the majors now? Oh no, he's been in three years. He's like their number four hitter. But he, for they, whom? They brought him up, and it was just, you know at first they were just oh this is Yastrzemski's kid, but he wasn't on you know like I followed the minor league. I I, I chart every like we were looking at it earlier uh, the draft picks you know and uh, uh, the I, I love the Giants. They got this draft pick. If you guys watched the College World Series, it was won by Mississippi State. Uh, this guy, stri- they, they, the, the combined strikeout was 21 strikeouts out of 27 outs, and this guy was the starter. And then he pitched the game three, which was the decisive game against Vanderbilt, and did the same thing, just struck out everything. And I, I am so ecstatic the Giants drafted him, uh, a Bednar, uh, William Bednar. And uh, this is the kind of thing that, you know, the, it, it, you've got a great team now, but you know what? Build for the future. Let's uh, uh, do it. That, hey, I, you know what? I'm going to give kudos to Cleveland. You get rid of that 10-game losing streak, and Cleveland is in the dogfight, uh, you know, uh, and, and they played great. They lost Lindor. You can't pay Lindor that kind of money. I, I mean, he's not a, Lindor's a great, great player, but he's not worth a a quarter or a third of a billion dollars. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like. Yeah, you, that's you what I'm saying is see, these, these teams, they blow money on stuff if you're smart and patient. You know, it, you got to be thinking long term and, and put your money in scouting and in player development. And just Cleveland's done a great job of letting guys go and they keep, bring, they keep bringing up these, especially uh, great starting pitching. I've been amazed at how they keep bringing these guys in. So you have, and that's, uh, I think that's a lot better to, to, like I said, to spend your money, whatever you have, on uh, get, it, get sign the best scouts that you can. 
get the best scouts and put put your money in player development and can then keep bring and then when guys get too expensive let them go and then keep the keep the ball rolling and then you can can keep content contending year after year right you know i i think you i think you got to key in on stuff like you need a power hitter obviously you know and and the one that got me was when the padres got rid of renfro and renfro ends up on boston and the thing was is yeah i, I like these guys from tampa bay and tampa bay is a great example of what we're talking about uh you know, and, and the thing with, like, the Tampa Bay and the Padres is they have, like, the number one and two rated minor leagues. So there's plenty more coming up the the, the channel there or whatever. But the uh, – I want to go with the Padres. The top – they got 100 top draft picks. And the Padres had four in there. You know, and every team has – you know, there's 30 teams. Uh, four of the top 100 draft picks were Padres – and they were all left-handed starting pitching. And that's an edge. You know, like, you, obviously, if you can cultivate left-handed pitching, uh, you know, that's, that's a big thing in your future. Uh, but here you are. you got a team that's competing in the West. If it wasn't for the Giants, you'd be right on top of the Dodgers. Dodgers would be where they're supposed to be. Uh, Giants are kind of throwing a mix in there, uh, you know, the unknown factor or whatever. But, uh, damn, it, 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 it's scary to think that the Padres can pull up, uh, you know, really good pitchers, great pitchers in the next three years. Because I believe, like, like a pitcher, if he throws hard, he doesn't need three, four years in the minor leagues. Those days are gone. But I do believe a position player does because they have to learn how to play shortstop. They have to learn how to play first base. That is not something you're just going to pick up on the slide or whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, but a pitcher, if he can throw 100 miles an hour and, you know, fairly decent location, uh, uh, yeah, bring him up. Why waste his arm in the minors? If this guy's throwing, up, if he's throwing 100 miles an hour in double or triple A, he could be throwing 100 miles in the majors. It, it's not that big of a stretch. Uh, so I believe, like, you know, uh, if you're going to go through the draft, you're going to get in there and, you know, you're fighting for your team's future, uh, pitching is the best because, uh, because, like I said, you, like this guy on the Giants, I, I'm making a prediction, right? What is it this year? 2020? I say he's a giant, uh, a major league giant by 2023. Uh, I don't mean, I, I want to talk, I love talking about the minor leagues. Right now, there's a guy, he, he won the College World Series with Oregon State. We love, I love watching Pac 10. You know, all these teams that have a chance to win, you know, Stanford this year, uh, UCLA every year, uh, Arizona was in there. This guy, uh, Mad Madrigal, he's on the he's not. He has the best strikeout ratio. Wins the College World Series with Oregon State. Uh, so I look up his minor league thing, and he played uh, junior college at Corvallis, which is where Oregon State is. Now I don't know if Corvallis is a satellite club for the minor league club. I mean for the college team. Or was he just at this college in community college and Oregon State says, hey, why do you want to come play for us? You know, uh, and this kid, uh, he's injured now, so he's out of the lineup. But it's amazing that in two years out of college that he gets to play for the White Sox, who right now is your nemesis and probably the favorite uh, easily to uh, go to the World Series. And Madrigal has uh, been batting good. Uh, Pittsburgh has another kid, uh, Nick Gonzalez from New Mexico State. He's batting 394 in the minors. But this Madrigal guy, uh, it came out, uh, this was on satellite radio, and uh, I, this is a good one for you. Okay, he has the lowest strikeouts per at bat. So what, but, and then uh, it was, the, I thought it was a, a high number, but. This is number one in the major leagues. In other words, he strikes out fewer than all these major league guys, and this is like his second year. Uh, do you know what that ratio is? Uh, it's one in 14. In other words, he only strikes out once every 14 at bats, and that's the best in baseball. But that's a contact hitter, you know. Uh, uh, and I love that. I love the Vandy guys coming right out. Uh, uh, coming right in and, and, and doing, you know, I believe that college 
is the greatest uh, new minor league, and I, I'm hoping guys like right out of college, like in football, you go right to the majors. Uh, you know what? And if you got the talent, uh, God bless it. Because you know what? Let's get college baseball uh, up on the same level. Let's let's get this going. Uh, you know, this year was a great year with Mississippi State. Uh, North Carolina State got screwed because of COVID. That was kind of that kind of stunk for them. Uh, Vanderbilt had no business being there. Uh, uh, but the, these these guys coming out of college uh, are really really saying, hey, this, this is let's get these guys and play them right away. Screw screw another two three years in the minors. They don't need it. Okay, we're uh, we're into extra innings. Uh, our guest has been Michael Krepensek. They call him Cabby. He's a San Francisco right. Bay Area sports fan. I believe he has a show called Left Turn at Alcatraz. Do you have any final words for our audience? Michael Krepensek. God bless y'all. Go Cleveland Indians. Al Rosen, I love you. Uh, 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 the best show we ever did was the Kevin Mitchell. Uh, me, uh, us and Kevin Mitchell just talked about Al Rosen the whole show. It was great. Hey, hey Rhea, I, like, I love I, I, the first time we had a show. We talked about I, this will be the final thought here because you like to do baseball history. That's why I love this show. Uh, we talked about the Civil War and when they had a truce, they would actually all play baseball against you. In other words, you, 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 that'd be the same as like playing with the Germans. So in the Civil War, they would all put, have these baseball games. This is 1800s people, way, way back then. And they they sit there, they go back to fighting or whatever, and they said all the troops came and played baseball. They all went home to the north. They went to the west. They went to the south. And that's why baseball in America flourished, because after the Civil War, due to the Civil War, everybody went home and they took baseball with them. And that that's a great story right there. The only positive thing of the Civil War uh, other is, is the, the creation of baseball and the migration of baseball. Hey, great talking, man. The 60s and 70s, man, any time, man. I, I go through that all day long. Thanks a million, Cabby. Our guest has been Michael Krepensek. That's a wonderful story about yeah. uh, baseball and the Civil War. And uh, and yeah. next week we will have uh, Jason McMinn, an analyst at Northeast Streaming. Dear listener, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night, everybody. Thanks again, Mr. Michael Krepensek. May your seven-inning no-hitter count as a national no-hitter. Okay. <laughs>